By the middle of the 19th century, it was apparent to many in Washington that America's founding fathers had left a legacy with two loopholes. A loose republic of states, perhaps divisible, with liberty and justice for some. In less than 75 years, the republic had grown from a colonial possession into a continental nation. Territory gained after the Mexican War stretched the country from sea to shining sea. Yet this new land threatened to divide the nation. Most republics throughout the course of history had not survived. The Americans of the first half of the 19th century were uncertain whether their republic would survive a serious crisis or would it break apart. Tensions were rising between the North and the South. Each wanted to settle the West in its own distinct image. The North is far more populous, far more economically developed than the South, but it has not exercised real political power in the nation. The South has had a stranglehold on the Democratic Party, on the presidency, on the Supreme Court. The nation was at a crossroads. The power struggle between North and South was escalating into a crisis that demanded an extraordinary president. As it turned out, Zachary Taylor was not that man. Number 12, Zachary Taylor. Whig, 1849 to 1850, 64 years old, from Louisiana. Zachary Taylor was a celebrity, a Mexican war hero who'd helped to win over half a million square miles of new land for the nation. He was also a political unknown. Zachary Taylor was someone who was not seeking the presidency. Both parties came to him and wanted him to be their candidate. As a war hero, he appealed to the North. As a Louisiana landowner and slaveholder, he appealed to the South. He had no obvious agenda, but in the end, he would surprise them all. There's something about Zachary Taylor. If I had to pick out a prototypical pre-Civil War American, I certainly would pick Old Rough and Ready. Taylor's nom de guerre, Old Rough and Ready, was as much a tribute to his fighting spirit as it was for his slovenly appearance. He had none of the polish of a professional politician and was not a great communicator. Taylor had never registered to vote and didn't even vote in his own election. Despite outward appearances, he was really a Washington insider. His army position had been arranged by his second cousin, James Madison. Robert E. Lee was his fourth cousin once removed, and Jefferson Davis had been his son-in-law. As president, Taylor deferred to others, going so far as to declare he would not exercise his veto power. Taylor didn't really see the presidency as a very powerful office, and he, uh, he was actually strongly influenced by members of his cabinet and by certain members of Congress. He did say that he believed that the slavery issue should be decided by Congress, and Congress would be the ruling body, and that he would go along with whatever Congress proposed. The slavery debate was beginning to get ugly. The fragile peace between North and South, established 30 years earlier by the Missouri Compromise, was starting to crumble. Well, when Zachary Taylor came into office, the country was facing a serious crisis over the question of the expansion of slavery into new Western territory. On one side, Southern extremists were threatening secession if Congress didn't rule in their favor. On the other side, the clamor of Northern abolitionists was growing louder. In response, Senator Henry Clay created the Compromise of 1850 a bundle of bills designed to link the admission of California as a free state with some slavery measures favorable to the South. So this was a kind of package that Clay put before the Congress 
giving some concessions to the slave states and some concessions to the free states, which he hoped uh, would, would go through and satisfy everybody. But the compromise didn't satisfy some people, including President Taylor. Taylor surprised a lot of people. Uh, he thought there was nothing to compromise about. He said, look, California should be admitted as a free state, and that's it. Taking back his promise, Taylor threatened to veto the compromise. Taylor insisted on going ahead, even at the risk of provoking southern state secession. Taylor's solution for the secessionists was somewhat simplistic. I'll hang him. And I might start with my son-in-law, Jefferson Davis, who was a senator from Mississippi at that time. I think his best moment was simply affirming the integrity of the nation in response to threats of disunion that were coming from the South as the controversy over the Compromise of 1850 intensified. Barely a year into his administration, Taylor was evolving into an ardent unionist. On a hot 4th of July in 1850, Taylor took a break from the political infighting to preside over a groundbreaking ceremony for the Washington Monument. Scorched by the summer sun, Taylor sought relief with a pitcher of milk and a bowl of cherries. Within hours, he complained of severe stomach pains. There are people who were proposing that he was actually poisoned by arsenic, that there was this conspiracy to get rid of him. Taylor died five days later. Most believed he succumbed to gastroenteritis, an inflammation of the intestines. But there were lingering suspicions of foul play. It would take more than a century before anyone would know for certain. In 1991, an historian convinced Taylor's descendants to allow his body to be exhumed. Forensic analysis revealed no signs of foul play. Instead, they determined that a form of cholera was the most likely cause of Taylor's death. As far as I'm concerned, he definitively was not poisoned with arsenic. Where Taylor might have taken the country is a mystery, but it would soon move in an entirely different direction when Taylor's vice president assumed the presidency.